Good morning. I appreciate you being here. I'm Ned Kalange. I'm the president and CEO of the Colorado Trust. And I was reminded that um, this is our seventh health equity learning series event. And uh, I appreciate, I recognize some faces that have been here for all, and I recognize some new faces and uh, new community uh, uh, leaders, and I really appreciate you being here. This uh, learning series is an opportunity that the trust sees to raise awareness and understanding about the issues around health equity. Our vision for the trust is that all Coloradans should have fair and equal opportunities to live healthy, productive lives, regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or where we live. To learn more about what we're doing in health equity, there's a fact sheet at each table explaining our vision and directing you to additional resources. There are other handouts at your table as well. There's an executive summary from a publication co-authored by our presenter today, Dr. Manuel Pastor and Rhonda Ortiz, and its title is Making Change, How Social Movements Work and How to Support Them. We also have a discussion guide to encourage you to continue the health equity discussion after the meeting with others, and a survey that we hope you'll complete at the end of the session to help us uh, make things better. You can find these resources as well as other resources on health equity at our website. If you have not seen the previous speakers, they are on video available at the website, and the website is uh, www.coloradotrust.org. I want to acknowledge our virtual participants. So we're live streaming this event with assistance from Open Media Foundation. Hundreds of others are joining us online in viewing parties in these 18 communities across the state. And I want to make sure I welcome everyone sitting in some place that isn't uh, in this room to the dialogue and the discussion. I'm also pleased to recognize uh, some special people, at least to, to me and I know to others in the room. We have uh, board members, Dr. Warren Johnson, Hi, Dr. Johnson, Dr. R.J. Ross, uh, Colleen Schwartz, I didn't see, but I hope she'll join us later. And of course, our former board chair, Dr. Patricia Baca. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I had a couple of legislators uh, mentioned in my list. You know, you might have noticed that they ended the session somewhat late yesterday. They may be sleeping in yet. And uh, so I'm not surprised that they're not joining with us. But if there are elected officials that I missed, uh, it, it's an oversight that I hope not to continue. Um, following the presentation, we're going to open up for a dialogue with the audience. I'm going to ask those who are uh, streaming the presentation to submit your questions via Twitter. Follow the Colorado Trust and use the hashtag HealthEquityTCT. So that's hashtag and HealthEquityTCT all run together. You can also email us questions at HealthEquity at coloradotrust.org. We try to do our best to answer as many questions as we can. If we can get to them all, that would be fantastic. So with those kind of introductory comments, oh, and uh, the hashtag and email, it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Manuel Pastor, professor of sociology, American studies, and ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Here he also serves as the director of the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity and the co-director of the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration. His recent research has focused on the economic, environmental, and social conditions that low-income urban communities experience in the United States. And I hope you'll help me welcome Dr. Pastor. So uh, I'm going to do this Oprah style and kind of walk around the room. Um, 
So great to be here. It's always wonderful to be in Colorado. Um, I seem to come to Denver frequently. Uh, when I got asked to come again for this event, I thought, what in the world can I talk about since I've come so often to talk about demographic change in Denver? And fortunately, they asked me to talk about a topic entirely uh, related but also different, which is social movements for the next America. So really happy to be talking about this. Um, and let's see whether we have power for the PowerPoint. We do. Uh, and there, by the way, is my Twitter handle. Please make sure to tweet me. And uh, by the way, for those of you who are younger, you know what that hashtag means. And for those of you who are older, hashtag does not mean what you think. It's a whole other, which is increasingly popular, I imagine, here in Colorado with your recent legislative change. Um, so social movements and what they do. One of the reasons why movements for change are so important is because America itself is changing. The rapidly changing demography, increasing inequality in the United States, and the need to try to address this through lifting up a common narrative, a common story, and some broader vision about where the nation needs to head. And it's pretty easy, particularly in the current circumstances, to think that social movements like the civil rights movement, uh, the women's movement, uh, are somehow no longer possible in this day and age. But let me point your attention to the Dreamers. This is a group of undocumented kids, illegal immigrants, who have apparently, quote unquote, no right to participate in United States discussion about future policy. And yet, through a concerted effort at both organizing youth, organizing allies, and coming up with a brand new narrative and frame about the American dream and how they were part of being dreamers, uh, they were really able to shift the entire sympathies of a nation so that dream acts are passing around the country. Um, they were actually able to persuade uh, President Obama to uh, past Deferred Action for Childhood Adjustments, DACA, which has allowed so many of them at least a two-year stay to be in the country. And they're largely responsible for changing the tone of the debate in such a way that comprehensive immigration reform got queued up in the Congress, passed through the Senate, and then has gone to the House, where, of course, all good things go to die. So, uh, but nonetheless, you would not have expected that a group of young people um, who did something very remarkable. Um, they borrowed from the LGBT movement the trope or act of coming out, that if you come out and say who you are, you're actually more effective than if you hide. They uh, wrapped themselves up in the American dream and the American flag, and they really had a positive vision about how they wanted to and were willing to contribute, and they've managed to shift the sympathies of a nation and policy as well. And so this is a very important set of things to pay attention to, particularly for those of us who are concerned about health equity. Um, and this has been happening, for example, in California. Um, and by the way, one thing I usually say at the beginning, but I'll say now, is that while I'm speaking, uh, my voice might break a little bit, particularly in the Q&A. Um, some of you might think it's because I'm emotional being with you. And I am. I mean, this is really the highlight of my month, for sure. Uh, but it's actually, this is great for a health audience, because I have a speech disorder that's called spasmodic dysphonia, spasms that affect your voice cords. Um, it's actually um, something that Diane Rehm from NPR has. It's quite famous. Robert Kennedy Jr. has. So I'm in good company. Uh, and I always like to tell people not to worry. It gets treated once a month with Botox, because that's how we treat everything in Los Angeles. So. It really works for us. Um, so one of the things we've discovered in California is there's been a big at attention in California to the question of health equity. And some of you may be familiar with the big initiative of the California Endowment, which is called Building Healthy Communities, in which they selected 14 uh, communities in California with the idea that these were places that were distressed socioeconomically and also distressed in terms of their health conditions. And they wanted to do place-based comprehensive change and policy and systems change with an eye toward health. And so, you know, health equity, equity around health. But here's what they found out in these 14 different communities. 
Here's the real things that got won. In Long Beach, uh, low-income workers got together and fought for a living wage in Long Beach for hospitality workers and enlisted the support of small business and labor to win that, and that's what's really making a difference in the Building Healthy Community site in Long Beach. In Fresno, which has been a place that's been characterized by sprawl and a kind of desertion of the inner city, the city uh, residents who are part of the BHC effort, the Building Healthy Communities effort, wound up working with the city planning department to come up with a new plan that's about compact development and infill development to try to bring resources back into the city, and they were able to pass it through uh, the city council. And interestingly, now the head of the planning department, who was a community organizer in the past, is now the president of Fresno Metro Ministries and in a faith-based organizing effort in Fresno. And across the 14 different sites, one of the things that they found out was really affecting youth health was the fact that young people get suspended from school for really modest infractions, for having a defiant attitude, which is really a teacher's interpretation of what they're doing, or for being truant, which is very easy to be in Los Angeles if you've ever been there and driven in the traffic. It's very easy to be late to school, particularly if you're reliant on mass transportation. So youth from around the 14 different sites got together and organized and helped push state policy with some assistance so that now there's a different set of school discipline policies, both at the local level and in the school level. And what this means is there's a fundamental kind of education going on for the California Endowment and for all of us who've been working in this field. And it is that and we've written about it in this uh, 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 book, uh, there's something happening here, um, which is that really what it takes is a movement building model to, that is central to achieving the policies that will enhance health. And part of that is creating community efficacy. We know that if communities are more efficacious, if they feel more like they can actually change things, if they have that sense of resilience, that's associated with health, but it's also associated with changing the policies that affect health. And so it's led to a kind of fundamental change in the thinking, in California at least, that we need to understand that there's sort of three uh, mechanisms in which change happens, projects, policy, and power. Projects demonstrate what's possible. Policy makes the possible standard operating procedure, but it's power that actually changes policy. And for too many years, both uh, the foundation world and in sometimes government thinks that if we just do a demonstration project and show people how we could change things, that they will simply slap their forehead and go, oh my gosh, what a mistake we made, let's change. You've got to move from what you learn from demonstration pod projects to be able to change policy. If you learn that uh, when kids don't get uh, kicked out of school for being truant, they actually do better, you have to change district policy and statewide policy, and the only way you make that happen is by changing the configuration of power that makes those decisions. So increasingly, there's interest in social movements, because social movements are sustained groupings that develop a frame or narrative based on shared values, not just interests, and we'll talk about that later, that have a broad base of the community and go for a long-term transformation in systems of power. And I'm gonna to try to talk about the work we've done in this field and a little bit about how it applies to the health equity arena in particular. So, um, we've done a lot of work in this field, starting with a book that I wrote called This Could Be the Start of Something Big, um, which, by the way, should be required reading for everyone in the health field in Colorado. And I know that the Colorado Trust has committed to buying everyone here a copy, and also in the satellite. Don't, we're not leaving you out. Um, and for those of you who are maybe not readers, not, not to worry, it's about to be made into a major motion picture. I just negotiated the rights, it's great. I'm gonna be portrayed by Antonio Banderas, so I'm very excited. So we've been working on this project of looking at these social movements things, and the way that we got to it actually is interesting. Um, my, I used to head a group called the Center for Justice, Tolerance, and Community at UC Santa Cruz, and I now run a research program called the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at USC. And for the last 
15, 20 years, I've actually been doing a lot of work with social movement organizations. And about five or seven years ago, someone said, well, you've done work with them on issues of fairness in the labor market, on issues of environmental injustice, on issues of immigrant integration. Why don't you study how social movements work since you're close to them? And we decided that that made sense. And since then, we've done a series of reports that look at uh, how change gets made, how youth leadership works to make change, uh, how groups can ally across difference to really build a bigger and better movement, uh, yeah, how things like the census can lead to people to be engaged in social movements, and then also uh, something I'll talk about at the end, how to measure the effectiveness of social movements. Um, so what have we found? How have we done the research and what have we found? Um, so the first thing is something that's un unfortunately remarkably useless a review of the academic literature. Now, I don't want to bag at my fellow academics, but we have a tendency to use multi-syllabic words to describe very simple principles, right? So there's a lot that's written on social movements, but a lot of it's pretty obscure. So we decided instead to take an approach of going to social movement leaders and asking them the question, how do you build movements? What are the key lessons and the key elements, and how can we boil them down into essentially 10 elements of movement building, and that's what I'll talk about. We've actually also done something somewhat interesting in this research process, which is now involved interviews and, and conferences with about 300 plus movement leaders. Um, we write a report, and the normal thing is you write a report, you debut it into the world, and you take a lot of credit for how brilliant you were for writing the report. Instead, what we do is we write a draft, we bring together movement leaders to comment on the draft, shift the direction of the draft, and then we present the final draft. We are usually presenting it with somebody from the immigrant rights movement, somebody from the labor movement, somebody from the environmental justice movement, somebody from the health movement, somebody from the food justice movement, so they can validate whether what we're saying is accurate or not. So what that means in part is that this work that I am presenting is really wisdom that comes from this field. So there's a lot of theories that are out there about uh, movement theory and movement practice. Uh, the one that's probably the most important right now in the field is the most recent, which is called framing theory. And what it says that's important, um, and I'll get to it in a little while, um, is that one of the things that social movements do is, not, is help to frame an issue provide a narrative around the issue, but also help to create identity for the people who are part of the movement. So the dreamers are not just about an issue, about uh, getting uh, the ability for people who came here undocumented as young children to be able to stay. They're actually creating an identity for themselves as dreamers, as activists, etc. And as it turns out, it has remarkable effects on their individual health and resilience. One of the things that we know is that, because there's a great study being done by a colleague called Veronica Tariquez at USC, is that young adults who have been through social movement training, particularly young adults of color, are more resilient. When they get to college and they take that first test and they maybe don't do so well, they, you have, they, there's two stories they can tell themselves. One story is, oh my God, I really shouldn't be here. I'm really a failure, et cetera. Or the other story they can tell is, you know what? I've been struggling against an educational system that has underserved me all my life. I come here with certain challenges that I've got to face that I'm going to face them, and I'm going to face them with other people, and I'm going to make sure that I beat the odds, and I'm going to make sure that I change the odds for everybody else who's coming up. Those are two different stories, and a social movement gives you that second story. Does that make sense? So um, there's a bunch about geography I'm going to get to in a second, but what I want to do is jump to what these kind of fundamental 10 elements, because what we realized when we were doing the research is essentially that Far more popular than academics is David Letterman. Right? And he's got a top 10 list, so we should have a top 10 list too. So I'm going to go through these, and you can think about them in three buckets. Kind of fundamental elements of movement building, tools about implementation, which I think are important to pay attention to, and uh, the, what, what we call scale, how it is that you 
kind of grow a movement, but also how you connect a movement um, across geographies. So let me go through those. The first thing that's really important um, is having a vision for a social movement that's much bigger than a particular policy. Van Jones, who was for a brief like six months in the White House uh, and is now on CNN Crossfire, he used to head something called Green for All. He famously reminds us that when Martin Luther King led the march on Washington and he gave his famous speech, he didn't say, I have an issue. He said, I have a dream, right? Many of us have an issue. Our issue might be food justice, it might be the living wage, it might be uh, access for the undocumented to health care, but really what animates that is a bigger dream about human dignity, capacity to participate, what does it mean to live in a democratic society where people can realize their potential. And so a vision is very important and a frame about that sets the terms of the debate. And why this is critical is because there's been a big shift in the organizing world from interest-based organizing to values-based organizing, from getting people together on their intersecting common interests, which is always important, but also getting people to understand their real values. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So a really important thing is having a vision and a frame. And I'll talk a bit about how this can apply to your work later. A second really key important thing is to have an authentic base in key constituencies. You know, you hear many people say that they have a movement when really all they have is a Twitter handle, <laughs> right? And maybe a long email list or something. So movements are not thin. Movements are thick. They actually have a base in community. And there's the kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship building, the house meetings, the organizing that actually brings people along uh, to be part of it. And the other thing that's really key about social movements is that they're continually developing leaders out of that base rather than simply having leaders who are pre-assigned. The most important thing is to really develop those new leaders so that communities are speaking for themselves. The third kind of fundamental element here is what uh, we think of as a commitment to the long haul. You know, uh, social movements are not episodic. Um, and they're not, you know, again, about an issue. Rosa Parks was not trying to get a better bus, right? She was trying to break down, eventually, the walls of discrimination. And it took an arc of organizing, you know, for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on how you count it, to be able to change things. When you think about what the LGBT movement has been doing about marriage equality, some really important things have happened there. One is it was a long arc. Second was they began to shift the direction to appeal to people's values, right? Around if you really value family, you should value anybody who wants to form a family and become part of a family. And how can you reject people from a family by virtue of their uh, preferences with regard to their sexual orientation. So social movements are not episodic and they're very different than coalitions. Many of you might be involved in coalitions. I'll give you one that's one of my favorite. Um, there is a coalition out there to end the embargo, trade embargo on Cuba, okay? And it consists of farmers in Iowa who wanna sell stuff to Cuba, uh, consists of other business people who wanna sell stuff, um, it consists of lefty radicals, right, who love Cuba and want to be able to go there easily, right? Uh, and it consists of people who want to buy old cars from Cuba and sell them in the United States, right? That's a coalition. They all agree on that one policy, right? But if they ever want it, they'd break apart because they don't have a shared vision or values for the future. That's what distinguishes a movement. We do a lot of coalition building. We don't do a lot of movement building. Um, the fourth thing, I think, here... Um, and this is uh, a little bit uh, tough. And by the way, I want you to think about one thing. We went through a discipline when we set up these 10 elements, because you'll see me switching to this in just a second. And the discipline was this set of categories has to explain not just social movements that progressives might like, 
things about immigrant rights or worker justice, et cetera, it has to be able to explain the single most important movement in the United States at least 10 years ago, and that's the evangelical right, right? Which had a big vision, right? Rooted in their values, right? They had an authentic base in the church community, and they had a very patient uh, strategy about how to build power over time and exercise uh, voice in the electoral cycle. So if you think about all these factors, they're not meant to explain just one end of the ideological spectrum. They're meant to describe what it means to build a movement. And this gets to this because if you're building a movement, you generally have to have an underlying economic model. I know you don't think about that sometimes, but it's actually really important. The reason is, is that movements are generally about redistributing resources from one group to another. And if that will wind up killing the economy, people won't go for it, right? So when the evangelical, well, actually more the business right, said if we cut taxes, which looks like it's redistributing income to the top, it's actually going to grow the economy. Um, it, you may not agree with that model, but it was an economic model they had, and they spent a lot of money trying to develop it. By the way, some of you may know that the uh, House Republicans commissioned a study on tax cuts and economic growth in the United States and from the Congressional Research Service, and it came out saying that there was no effect of tax cuts on economic growth in the United States. So the House Republicans uh, suppressed the study, prevented it from being released, and then somebody filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and it's come back out into the public. Just an interesting aside. Um, but for those of you who are, I mean, one of the key things that's been an argument, for example, around the expansion of health care is that it's economically rational, right? Not just that it's going to redistribute resources so that low-income people can get health care, but that somehow that it's economically rational, it makes for a more vibrant economy, too. Element number five is the need to have a vision of government and governance. And one thing I think that's important about social movements is that they tend to have a theory of what the government can do uh, and an idea of the government as being needing to step up to be a tool of change and a full expression of democracy. The sixth thing that's become increasingly important for movements is for them to have a scaffold of solid research. So one of the things, one of the most successful movements uh, in the United States, one that's led to these increases in the minimum wage in states, and now with the discussion at national level, has been the living wage movement. And behind every living wage campaign was a research study looking at whether or not it would impact the government. The Dreamers, they wound up commissioning 200 legal professors, law professors, to write a brief talking about why Obama could actually do deferred action for childhood adjustment and it would be constitutional. And when they did it, it passed constitutional muster. It had a scaffold of solid research. The uh, evangelical right and the broad right wing uh, conservative movement had really important research in the form of the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, et cetera. Research is an increasingly important part of this and having academic partners is too. It's important to have a pragmatic policy package. Social movements have big views, but social movements also need to say how they're going to change the world in a very practical way. So those are all the kind of mediating elements. What do we mean by scale? So there's a couple things about social movements that I think are really important to pay attention to. Three things that have to do with scale, the last one being the most important. So first is that moving power requires organizations that are sufficiently large to move power. And that means that we shouldn't be scared of large organizations. Sometimes people, when they see small organizations, they say, gosh, they must be more authentic. Sometimes they're just small, <laughs> right? So the question is, how could you maintain authenticity as you get big enough to raise the issues up so that you can actually get a place in the public square, get your voice out there, get an issue changed? This, the ninth element, and this is very important, including here in the state of Cal Colorado, is to have a strategy for scaling up. Now, successful social movements have a theory of change with regard to the scale that they're going to take as well. And just to give you two, how many of you have read that book, What's the Matter with Kansas? It's about the conservative, uh, essentially, 
political takeover of Kansas. And what's interesting about it is if you read the book carefully, people first ran for the school board, then they ran for the city council, then they ran for county government, then they started running for the state. And then what grew out of Kansas became a conservative movement that was more powerful in the Midwest and then more powerful nationally. They had a theory of change with regard to scale. The people who've moved the wage debate in the nation up to the national level, they have moved it by doing living wage campaigns, community benefits agreements, minimum wages at the state level in various different kinds of places. People have a theory of scale. And here in Colorado, for example, your PICO organization, which is one of your interfaith organizations, has made the choice to ally themselves Hi out there, you and Aurora from PICO. Uh, I know at least they're watching that there's PICO organizations all over the state, but they become part of one group, Colorado Together, which is about understanding what the geography of change might be here. And this is very important because we often think about affecting things at a state level, affecting things at a national level, without beginning to build up from the local level first. The tenth and most important element, I think, is a willingness to network with other movements. One of the things, if I uh, leave you with anything, I think it's really important to uh, leave you with is there's a person who I think is like the best community organizer in the country who you've probably never heard of, named Anthony Thickpen, a uh, former Black Panther who actually is organized a group now in California called California Calls, which in the last electoral cycle mobilized 500,000 new and occasional voters to the polls and is probably the margin that allowed us to pay pass an increase in uh, income taxes and sales taxes to be able to restore the fiscal balance of the state. Um, and Anthony once said something I thought that was very important. Some people are empire builders and some people are movement builders. Some people are about building their own institution and some people are about building the ecosystem. And how that's different you can hear from two stories I'll tell. There's a group I work with in South LA called Community Coalition. It's been there for 25 years, very important, uh, very good friends with that organization. In fact, I lift weights with their executive director. You can't be closer than that, right? Because you know, if I did something he didn't like, he could drop something on me, right? Um, and so you would imagine that's an organization, we're close to them, that they could ask me to do anything and I probably would do it. Does that make sense? Here's the only thing they've ever asked me to do and said you've got to do it, is to provide help with strategic planning for another organization in East LA called Inner City Struggle. Because they knew that unless an organization in East LA working on youth issues was equally strong, had a very good understanding of the terrain, was very uh, you know, key to moving things forward, that their work in South LA wouldn't be able to change all of LA. It was about building the ecosystem, not about building the empire. And ex for example, for us, uh, with the research center I head, we always ask a really interesting question, which you might not expect. When somebody approaches us with work and money, our first question is, can someone else do it? And if that someone else does it, are we building their part, their strength in another part of the state? So for example, we get approached by a group in Fresno in the Central Valley about an environmental justice study. And we've done a lot of them in Los Angeles and the Bay Area, and we certainly have the capacity to do it. And they said, can you please do a study? And I said, no but I'll go up there and talk to you about how to form a university community partnership to do an environmental justice study. And they brought down people from UC Davis, Center for Regional Change. They worked together on the study. We provided data assistance and critique and some rejiggering of it along the way. They released it together. Just this last year, they got a $200,000 grant from the California Wellness Foundation to do more work in environmental justice. We built the ecosystem, and the stronger our partners are, the stronger we are. And that's what we mean when we're talking about movement building. So there's a lot of capacities to doing this, the capacity to organize a base community, to research frame and community, communicate, et cetera, et cetera. I wanna just say, I'm gonna jump over a whole bunch of slides that I was gonna show, because the problem is speakers are always overly ambitious, right? Um, so I wanna just show one slide here, and then the final slide, and then we'll get to the discussion. Um, we got asked, after doing all this work, to try to 
uh, think about how to evaluate movements. And one of the things that we figured out pretty quickly was something that Albert Einstein reportedly said. But if you follow Albert Einstein, you realize almost anything smart that got said, people say Albert Einstein said it, so I'm pretty sure he said this, but he might not have, but he, he might as well have said it, right? Uh, which is that not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. And it turns out that when we evaluate, and often when we build movement or build coalitions, we tend to focus on transactions, deals, rather than transformations, the fundamental change in what happens to people. So we asked the question, how many people did you bring to a meeting, not how many leaders did you develop? We asked the question, how many letters were signed about a particular policy, not whether or not you built enough capacity in your leaders so that they don't get split off from other groups by wedge issues. We focus on transactions, not on transformations. And if you really want to build a movement, it is really fundamentally about transformation. I can give you one example about how that's different, then I'll go to my last slide. Um, I do a lot of work on bringing together African Americans and immigrants. Very important work in Los Angeles, important work here too, but particularly at LA. And there's two approaches to that. One is an interest-based approach, which says something like, huh, I wonder how we can persuade black people to support comprehensive immigration reform. Or, I wonder how we can get Latinos to support an issue that's important to African Americans. There's another approach, and the other approach is to ask the question, if you're working in an, immig in an immigrant community, how can we teach people the importance of the African American struggle for civil rights and human rights in the United States, and how that is the bedrock for any struggle for social justice in the United States, and because it's the bedrock, those are the alliances that need to be formed. That is not transactional, that's transformational. And when you're working in an African-American community, how many of you have read the book, The Warmth of Other Suns, which is about the great migration from the South? All you gotta do is hand that book out. And people say, oh yeah, we were that too when we moved from the South. And working on transformational organizing rather than transactional organizing is exactly kind of consistent with values-based organizing versus interest-based organizing. So jumping over all this and to this dramatic and rather emotional last slide. Um, so what do movements need to do, particularly around health equity? The first thing is stress the inside game and the outside game. A lot of what I've talked about is kind of building power on the outside. But really it's also important to understand who the allies are inside government, and in particular inside agencies. There's often very good allies within agencies and foundations and others, and it's not simply a matter of playing an outside game, it's a matter of finding out who those allies are and what they're doing. I think it's also important to stress that equity and inclusion are actually fundamental and not add-ons. They're not things that you do afterwards, right? That there, you don't grow the economy. Then think about all the poor people you left behind. You actually think about how do you put people into the front end of this. Um, you need to build movements that can persist over time, but can also pivot from issue to issue. So as you move from you know, uh, whether or not affordable care gets rolled out the right way, to what are we gonna do about the people who got left out, and particularly the undocumented population. Uh, that's pivoting to the next issue while being persistent about the values and the goals that you have in front of you. Um, I'm gonna say just two other things. The last two are to understand multi-generational change and build leadership. One of the things I think that's really important to do is to think about the next generation of leaders who are coming up. And one of the things that we often don't do is think really in particular about building youth leadership and really working with young people and actually also having young people be the people who set the agenda moving forward. We're finding in California that they're the ones who are very creative about moving things forward uh, and we think that that's important to continue to do. The last thing I'll say is that uh, we need to, in building movements that really bring people together across different communities, across different constituencies, and across different sectors, begin to practice a very different kind of leadership, a sort of leadership that has not been very typical in the highly polarized, highly sorted 
America we've become. I used to run a program called Summer Institute Social Change Across Borders at the University of California, Santa Cruz, about 15 years ago that brought together community organizers from Latin America with community organizers from Latino communities in the United States to think about issues of transnational organizing. And at the end of one of those meetings, an organizer from Sinaloa, Mexico, Victor Quintana, said, you know, there's only two kind of leaders in this world, leaders who play the game of chess and leaders who play the game, the jigsaw puzzle. And like you, we were looking at him going, what the hell do you mean? And what Victor said was, well, in chess, there's only two colors, black and white. In the jigsaw puzzle, there's many different colors. And in fact, a single piece can be multi hued In chess, some pieces are far more powerful than others. You are really bummed out when you lose your queen, particularly to a pawn. In the jigsaw puzzle, every piece is important because you know that feeling of frustration when you get to the end and just a few are not there, and you know it's your children, right? <laughs> In chess, you literally move ahead by knocking somebody down and off their territory. You gentrify them. In the jigsaw puzzle, you make progress by fitting the pieces together so seamlessly that you don't know where one ends and another begins. In chess, the object is to win. In the jigsaw puzzle, the object is to complete the tapestry. We've been playing way too much chess and not enough jigsaw puzzle. We're playing it in the country as a whole, between the right and the left, uh, between city and suburb, between one generation and another generation. But because of that, we often wind up practicing a politics that ourselves, that's more the politics of chess and victory over others than the policy of the jigsaw puzzle and recognizing our common fate. If there's one simple admonition, movement building, it's about the jigsaw puzzle. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dr. Pastor. I thought that was inspiring and uh, really fantastic. We're moving into the uh, question and dialogue part of the discussion. So you get the first shot. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I think it was great. Um, I'm from Padres y Jóvenes Unidos here in Denver, who works on ending the school to jail track, um, you know, ed reform, health justice, et cetera. And what we're finding is we've had a lot of wins. For example, we passed a new discipline policy in Denver Public Schools. We initiated and won, it took two sessions, a state law to end zero tolerance across the state. And then we did a new intergovernmental agreement with the police department to limit their role in discipline, school discipline. We're at the point where um, we have to shift and pivot <laughs> to the question of accountability and implementation. And we feel that that training is, is really um, for the community is around self-governance, self-determination, and really helping to build a real democracy. And I wondered if you had um, any experience with that piece of the work. A lot of people win something and they go on to the next issue. But we, we're seeing they don't get implemented unless we organize for that. And just wondered what you had to say. Thank you. That's a very important thing, the question of implementation. I know, for example, in California, when the first big community benefits agreement was signed, which was with uh, the Staples Center, LA Live, and the Lakers, um, which was to deliver a lot of benefits to the community and agree for expanding that, it was very important for people to think about, actually, so we've guaranteed there's going to be jobs. Have we actually created a pipeline for people to train for those jobs? And they wound up setting it up in the, with partnerships with the community colleges. Um, we worked in Los Angeles on getting a policy to retrofit municipal buildings, but couple that with a policy to train young African Americans and Latinos through the unions and the apprenticeship programs uh, to be able to be, take at least some of those jobs as they come forward. And we're right now in the midst of uh, California passed um, the uh, 
a driver's license bill so that undocumented could get uh, licenses to be able to drive, uh, which will make California a safer place. It'll help the economy. Uh, and it'll actually probably help with school truancy because people will be able to get to school on time. So many good things about it. So we're working with the Los Angeles Police Department on how do you roll it out in a way so people are not scared to get the license, uh, that they understand that they'll be okay, and that the police know how to not sort of send people to uh, ICE as a result. So I, I think that we often leave off the implementation thing, and you're right, you actually need a lot of community capacity to do that. And that's in part why I made the mention of organizations that are, are sufficiently big Right, to be able to do that. And by the way, I've heard of your organization before. You guys are doing great work. If I could, uh, Professor Don Mares, I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the uh, Colorado Trust. I also run the MHA affiliate here, Mental Health America affiliate in Colorado. And probably most importantly, my son is a recent graduate of Southern Cal, so fight on uh, last year. But uh, I, I wondered if you'd comment on something. I, I thought one of the most powerful things you said uh, to me was the impact of organizing on young people and how they react to adversity when they're in college, which I assume uh, it, it would translate to greater um, sort of resilience. I mean, what is the, I, I found that very powerful. It feels like it almost is uh, in some way a, uh, a, a way to help in some of our communities, Latino, African American, wherever, where there's not family role models as, as much. Uh, whether that concept has an application broader, uh, in a broader way, because it just feels like it could be a very powerful um, kind of lesson that you've learned that could have a broader application, but I'd be curious what your, uh, your thought is on that. Yeah, you know, um, so I, th I think it's a very important thing, and it, gets, it helps me lift up one of the generational things that was kind of went very quickly through. I think a lot of people, I'm 57 years old, so a lot of people my age, uh, you look younger, but you've got equally gray hair. Uh, so. Way to go, brother. Uh, so these are, we, we say we, we've earned our canas. We've earned our gray hairs. Um, but one of the things I think people of my generation coming through were like the first Latino or the first African American was there may not have been a lot of role models. So we had a kind of almost self inoculation to be able to get through circumstances where people never expected you. I mean, I went to, uh, I was in high school and was not tracked for college. There was a surprise when I went to college, at least to the college counselors. I went to the university, I wasn't tracked for graduate school. I went to graduate school, I wasn't tracked for a research university. I'm a full professor at the University of Southern California. I could have flunked your kid, so, but instead I gave him an A. So, uh, so, but I think a lot of us who go through, we have a, almost like a kind of confidence that who knows where it came from, family, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we're finding, and it gets to both things, is Number one, when students, young people go through social justice training and they feel some ability to change the world, maybe by getting a new park into their community or by getting a farmer's market into their community or changing school discipline policy, they feel effective, they feel efficacious, and they feel like they can conquer the world. And what's interesting is they don't feel like they can conquer the world themselves, they feel like they can conquer the world by uniting with other people to change things. And it gives them a story, a narrative, a frame to move forward. So I think we should think about social justice organizing as a way to change the world, but also as a way to inoculate our youth so that they can actually make sense of the world and get through it. One of the things I think that's really important here, though, is mentorship and role modeling. And here I think the problem is that a lot of people of my generation, because we weren't particularly well mentored, we don't actually mentor well to the younger generation. And I like to tell younger people, have a little bit of patience with us. And one of the things I know, any of you who work with young people, they are eager right now for mentorship, for leadership. They're looking for people who've been in this field, right? Uh, either of health or health equity or social justice or political change. And sometimes those of us who are a little bit older aren't always the best mentors. I think we need to make ourselves be much better mentors. And we have to ask young people to have a little bit more patience with us. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to follow up because I saw you had a slide that you had to skip around philanthropy and um, their role, and I'm wondering specifically to what you just said, the role in training, inspiring the next generation. Do you see examples of that? You, you had something about a shift in the foundation world, and I was curious about that. 
So the first uh, one we wrote actually had some really big instructions to philanthropy. So I'm going to try to tell you two things that we thought philanthropy shouldn't do, and then two things we thought philanthropy should do. So one thing philanthropy should not do is think it's the movement, right? Shouldn't be, I mean, they, you know, people in philanthropy get a little caught up. They go, yeah, we're changing things, right? You're not changing things. You're funding people who change things. So, you know, I think it's really important to not think you're the movement. The second thing, uh, but that you're allies for, that you're supporters of, you're co-learners with people who are movement organizers. Uh, the second thing that I think is kind of important is, you, sh you know, you shouldn't be upset when the people you're funding make other people angry. That's their job, right? They're supposed to lift up the tough issues, and they may get into a little bit of hot water. And you know, you shouldn't. You should uh, have an expectation that that might be the case. And just to give you an example from a different uh, world about that, um, I was part when I was at Occidental College before at USC. We ran something called the Multicultural Summer Institute, which brought in kids, uh, largely African American and Latino, but we also brought in white kids from rural environments who are going to be culturally freaked out by Los Angeles, right? And put them into a five-week program, what was called a bridge program, uh, before they got into the university, uh, except there was one thing, that two things that were unique about this bridge program. It was really oriented around social justice, right? And the second was, it was actually harder than a college. Our expression was, we beat you up in a supportive setting. Um, and those students who were disproportionately students of color and often low income actually had a higher graduation rate than regular than the other college students who were not them in the college. They had a higher five-year graduation rate. So we were very proud of that, but I remember one day walking into the administration building and the administration building had been occupied by a lot of graduates of this program who were protesting something. And the director of admissions came up and hugged me and said, we admitted these students and we trained them. And she was so proud, right? So I think that we need to understand that these people that you fund who are supposed to make trouble will make trouble. The, the, the things I think that foundations uh, can do uh, is to uh, stick with people over the long term to understand that this stuff takes some time to try to figure out the people that you want to bet on or the organizations you want to bet on and then allow them to do that. That's what venture capital does with firms. That's what we ought to be doing with organizations uh, as well. And then I, I think the other thing is that, you know, if these admonitions get followed, there's actually uh, a big role for foundations who are often asking their grantees to collaborate, to collaborate as well, right? So why ask for 10 different theories of change? One small organization is going to have a real tough time doing all of that, right? Why not figure out if there's a big kind of change that you're thinking about? Why not kind of collaborate amongst the foundations? And that is happening, by the way, more and more, at least in California. The foundations are collaborating quite effectively together. Um, they did a lot of that work around the census, uh, collaborating on the count. Uh, done a lot of the work around the rollout of a Affordable Care Act in California, where they've been models of collaborating for the common good, since that's what they're expecting their grantees to do. You talked about uh, forming alliances, formal groups, and, and thinking about transformation at, in a larger scale. And uh, just briefly, uh, again, my interest is underserved populations from a health perspective. That's what I focus on. And we are currently focused on refugee populations. So we have a center that we've been developing focused on refugees. We are sitting in a region that is heavily Hispanic, and yet we are to some degree ignoring that population. And so something we have struggled with is this idea of, okay, at, at some level, yes, it helps to focus on a particular population from every perspective, including funding. On the other hand, to your point of thinking about commonalities across different groups with, different, with similar needs. And I must say, so your, your talk makes me think harder about how we've approached it and whether we should be thinking more broadly or no. Strategically, yes, you have to keep it narrow. Um, 
you know, I guess I would say it differently. Tactically, you might want to keep it narrow. Strategically, you might want to keep it broad. So, um, so I think it's really important for people to be able to see their common interests. One of the books we wrote that was published a couple of years ago has a, the book is pretty good, but the title's even better. Uh, it's called Uncommon Common Ground. And what it's meant to evoke is that when people often seek to form alliances, they often work from the lowest common denominator, like what's the least thing we could agree on, rather than the highest common ground, the uncommon common ground, the thing that took a little bit of time to get there. Now, I think in order to do that, that means people have to come in conversations with one another. So whether or not uh, Hispanic or Latino leadership in Colorado, in Denver, is being brought into conversation with the refugee population to look at what the issues are and figure out what's common and what can be worked on. And what's also, I mean, one of the things I think that's really important, because we do a lot of work on race. And a lot of people think that when you're talking about building alliances across race, what it means is you have to avoid conversation about race. Our strategy is you need to get race up front to get race behind. You have to talk about people's different heritage and community and difference. And when people feel like they're seen, then they start working on issues like access to health, whether or not there's food in their community, whether or not there's parks to, for kids to play in, whether or not there's too much obesity, whether or not transit gets them to jobs. And race, which needed to be up front for people to be seen, winds up getting put behind. And so I think those are some of the lessons that I would bring forward into uh, thinking about that that kind of kind of work of looking for uh, common ground. I mean, one of the things I think that's uh, a particular challenge with what you're uh, raising is that often people talk about refugees separate from immigrants and talk about immigrant integration without bringing refugees into that conversation and asking what's working well for refugees that might work well for non-refugee immigrants, what's working for immigrants and immigrant communities that might also facilitate what's going on with refugees, and then how do you build alliances between those two groups, and how do you make for a more welcoming state overall? And you've done some pioneering work on that in the state. Hello, thank you. I'm right here. <laughs> um, thank you for your comments and for your work. Um, I'm an independent practitioner in organization development and change, and I work both as an internal and an external uh, consultant. And in my experience, the, it, the notion of commitment for the long haul is a pretty scarce commodity. And um, I'm, I'm really curious about how in a, a culture that rewards the immediate, uh, that encourages like a one, a one bang kind of um, approach, can really begin to make this shift to realizing that a lot of the things that really matter do take time. So, I mean, let me say a word about my way to it, um, and then uh, maybe a different path to get there. So, um, you know, I cut my teeth on this community work um, when I uh, had been involved in community stuff, but in the late 1980s, um, as an academic, I got involved in a campaign led by an interfaith group, the Industrial Areas Foundation in Southern California to raise the minimum wage. It was called the Campaign for Moral Minimum Wage. And what was interesting about that campaign was it won, and we got an increase in the minimum wage, and it transferred $4 billion of income to low-income people in the first couple of years. Uh, but I learned something very fundamental from it, which was that, you know, I like to think that my ideas had made the difference, but it turned out that I you know, was asked to train their leadership and then testify about why increasing the minimum wage would be a good idea. And uh, it turned out that uh, what the people who were the organizers and leaders of this community figured out was that when you increase the minimum wage, what do people do with it? Spend it. And because they're low income, what do they spend it on? Food, right? So they went to the head of the grocery store association and asked him to, spe to uh, support an increase in the minimum wage. And uh, he said he couldn't do it because, you know, that's anti-capitalist, right? 
the minimum wage. And they said, fine, we're going to shop at your store tomorrow. And he said, well, what kind of threat is that? So the next day they showed up at his store and they shopped with pennies. Have you ever been in line when somebody's doing that? <laughs> they jammed up his store for a day. People in South LA still remember this. And the next morning, the head of the Grocery Store Association came out in favor of it, increasing the minimum wage. And what I learned from that was that organizing mattered to change policy. And I'll get to the long term here in a second. So after that bit of an epiphany, I applied for and got a uh, Kellogg Fellowship, uh, which was something that was around uh, the, about 20 years ago. And they used to choose 40 uh, youngish people and give you uh, some money and time off to pursue a project of your own choosing. Uh, I used to call it a MacArthur Award for people who weren't geniuses. <laughs> and so I chose to do community organizing for three years around African American, Latino, and Asian, Pacific Islander economic development in Los Angeles. And so I was part of this circle of people uh, who were kind of working on this issue. And then the LA civil unrest happened. And right after the LA civil unrest, many of us were running from meeting to meeting, thinking that if we just went to one other meeting, we'd actually change things. Have you ever done that? I mean, you might be doing that now, right? So, <laughs> and in the, at the, the kind of middle of one of those meetings, a community organizer leaned back and said, you know what? There's an immediate need to think long term. And it hit us like a rock that like while people were talking about the economy changing over the long haul or the trade pact with Mexico or regional, we were thinking about inch by inch sort of the little specific things or issue by issue. And I got to say Los Angeles, which was once known uh, in the 1920s as the wicked city because it was so anti-labor, so anti-progressive, uh, so opposed to any kind of change, and so disempowering of African Americans and Latinos, really frozen out of the political system, which has become a place where, you know, there's movements around organizing janitors, and there's a vibrant movement around environmental justice, and there's a vibrant movement around school reform and school discipline, and a vibrant movement around food justice, and farmers markets popping up in poor communities, because people are seeing it as part of a long-term process to making a better city realize its potential and promise. I wish to God that you don't have to have a riot to understand that. Um, but we need an epiphany. And the epiphany is that we are really in this together for the long haul. And I, I think what's really, I think epiphany is underrated. Um, I think people think that we're going to move people, and this is why framing is different than messaging. Messaging is kind of trying to trick somebody with a message into doing something you want. Framing is developing a story that you actually believe. Those dreamer kids, they believe they're American, and they believe they represent the best possible hopes of America, and that treating them decently and realizing their full potential will be good for the country as a whole. The LGBT folks who are working around marriage equality are saying we are human beings too, and we deserve the full measure of dignity for ourselves and our children. They are embracing something bigger, longer, and more unified. Whatever the epiphany is that moves us there, we actually need to be in the business of producing it. So Dr. Pastor, if I could uh, ask a question. I look around the room and I see a lot of <clears throat> my colleagues in the nonprofit world, people who belong to organizations that I would say have not traditionally or historically engaged in social movement or social movement building. So how does an organization who is in service delivery or advocacy outside of social movement, how do they start in a social movement activity or how they become part of one? How, what's your advice? So uh, there's some general advice, but just to give one simple, I mean, uh, lesson is that, uh, that one of the reports I talked about beyond the count was kind of interesting because what we did was looked at how uh, the opportunity of the census count was used as an opportunity to bring together nonprofits that serve populations that wanted them to be counted with social movement organizations that also wanted them to be counted for electoral reasons, right? So they were able to come together around those common interests. And, you know, two things happened. One is that the 
nonprofits kind of began. And by the way, getting people organized for the count is a lot like organizing to change policy. You have to go and talk to people about this activity. It's a campaign that's time limited with a very specific focus. You could get pretty measurable about whether you did it or not, right? And you can actually only really improve the count by knowing where the communities are that are going to be undercounted and doing the organizing to bring them to. So they coupled some high tech stuff and mapping to figure out where the hard to count census tracts were with nonprofit agencies that were very eager to make sure these populations got counted for the purposes of getting funds to them with community organizers. And what was interesting there was that the foundations took the lead at understanding that the census didn't have any money to really deal with the undercount this last time, and the only way it was gonna happen was through supplemental funds. And it created a platform for nonprofits and community organizers to actually get together for the nonprofits to recognize what the organizers were doing, and then also for the uh, organizers to recognize the importance of service delivery, which is sometimes looked down upon as well. But of course, that's part of the implementation thing that you were talking about as well. So creating opportunities for conversation. I would not suggest that nonprofits jump into organizing themselves. I would suggest that they look for those organize, organizations that are already doing this and look to partner up on things and then see whether it makes sense for them. One of the things that we've seen over time is that some nonprofits are developing their sort of community, they're developing a community organizer position uh, that's part of what they do in order to get more clientele in. Or they're uh, doing, there's a great group uh, in Los Angeles called, the Asian, called Advancing Justice Los Angeles. They're more well known as the Asian Pacific American Legal Center, but they're remarkable because there's four Asian organizations around the country, they've all submerged their identity under one term, advancing justice, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, so they can be branded nationally, so they can scale from their cities to the nation. And here's one thing that Advancing Justice LA has realized, is they've got all these people coming in for services in dealing with immigration and naturalization services, but they haven't done a concerted effort to get them to naturalize, and in the process of doing that, providing them with education around the issues, connecting them up with community organizing, community advocacy, et cetera, and they're beginning to couple organizing opportunities with the delivery of actual services. You're also seeing that, I mean, that's been at least in California, I don't know how you guys did it, but it's a lot of community organizing groups that did a lot of the education around the Affordable Care Act and how to sign up for it and the Medicaid expansion, and that's creating other sets of ties between community health clinics and community organizing groups. So creating those opportunities to talk together, to campaign together, to learn from each other. So thanks, Manuel, well for your presentation. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about framing again. And so um, the question is, can framing be too large? And are there risks in that? And the reason I ask that is because what intrigues me lately is this, this conversation we're having about income in, uh, inequality and kind of the converging working families. Um, and so it seems to me that for immigrant rights, and in particular for refugees, um, the notion that we plunk refugees down into working family, into working poor. They struggle with um, health care. They struggle with um, affordable daycare and child care. They struggle with housing being outrageously expensive. So can we bundle a lot of the different groups, immigrants, health care, access, into kind of this movement around working poor, income inequality, or is it too large? What a great question. Um, so. First, do you know what the number one best-selling book in the country is right now? Capital by Thomas Piketty. It's a 776-page book about economics translated from the original French. Not well. Uh, and it's the most popular book because there's this tremendous interest in the level of inequality in the United States and what's driving it. And there's a tremendous opportunity, I think, to address it. And I think that that's a stream into which this stuff will enter. But let me just talk a little bit about that. But I think the problem with the income inequality thing is it's not yet well framed, so it's hard for people to figure out how to get into it. So I just want to talk about two uh, things where, that I think have been interestingly framed and it seem to have made a difference. Um, and they're ones that I've been... Uh, a part of. Uh, 
One is immigrant integration. Uh, one thing that's been really interesting about this is we uh, started using that term. I know it's been used here for a longer period of time. But we started using that term about five or six years ago in California, in particular in Los Angeles. And we consciously used it as part of an effort with the California Community Foundation. Um, and what we did was we started doing focus groups, and what we realized was the following thing. When you say immigrant, and when you say immigration reform, people's mind immediately goes to legal, illegal. And they get stuck. And that stuckness is really a problem, partly because in California, 2.7 million Californians are undocumented. One-sixth of our children have at least one undocumented parent. Our undocumented residents have actually been in the country for longer, half of them for longer than 10 years. And so we actually just finished a report in which we coined the term undocumented Californians. There are, you know, there are undocumented, God damn it. Um, you know, they're part of California deeply. Uh, but when we started doing the work on immigrant integration, we realized if you said immigration reform, people got stuck in legal illegal. If you said immigrant rights, which appealed to a lot of immigrant organizers, it doesn't really make any sense in the United States. Because immigrant rights is a tradition that comes out of human rights. And we don't have a human rights tradition in the United States. We have a civil rights tradition. And that civil rights tradition is you have rights if you're a citizen. But if you're just a human being, right? I mean, that's a tradition in Latin America and Asia, but it's not a tradition in the United States that just human beings have rights. So when you use the term immigrant integration, it kind of appeals to two values that people really like, integrating into the society and being an immigrant. And integration is actually can be a two-way thing, doesn't mean cultural assimilation or disappearance. So with the California Community Foundation, we created a Council on Immigrant Integration. And I shared this last night, but I think it's valuable to share here. We convened the Council on Immigrant Integration, and who you would think would be on that would be immigrant rights activists and advocates. And they had a role. But we also had the Chamber of Commerce, the LA Police Department, the LA Sheriff's Department, educational leaders, uh, black leaders, people leaders in the educational community, because immigrant integration is about all of us. And as a, the first thing I asked people to do on the first day before they came back for the next meeting three months later is to go out and have lunch or breakfast with somebody they didn't know. And the guy from the chamber went out with the head of the largest uh, immigrant rights group in Los Angeles. Three years later, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce came out in favor of the California Dream Act. And one of their top three legislative priorities when they went to Congress to lobby because they go once a year, was comprehensive immigration reform. And the head of the immigrant rights group is now serving on a committee of the chamber, all under this frame of immigrant integration and why it's actually good for all of us. So I think there's real power to framing things. And I think the struggle now is to frame things about what does it mean to have a more equitable America. And what I think is rough about the income inequality framing is it drives us to look at the distributional issues alone. And here's what I want to say is I think a little bit different about the immigrant integration frame uh, and also the dreamer frame that we need to borrow here. And it is that, and this is actually common sense, if you think about it, um, if you run a business, you know that your business is more successful if you treat your workers right, if you treat your consumers right, if you treat your suppliers right, your business will be more successful in the long haul. So why in the world do we think that if we run an economy which essentially mistreats those at the bottom and over rewards those at the top, that we're somehow gonna have an economy that works in the long haul? And is there any coincidence that the peak of income inequality, last peak was 1928, the year before the Great Depression, the last peak was 2007, the year before the Great recession, and we haven't done very well as an unequal society, and it's incredibly critical that we deal with it now, because if this level of income inequality and racial inequality gets channeled into the future, given the changing demographics, we won't have a more productive United States economy and society moving forward. And to me, the issue around income inequality is not just that it's unfair. It is. It's that it's actually bad for everyone. It 
causes huge amounts of social distance. It leaves the next generation underprepared for the future. It leaves us underinvesting in their future. And it creates a situation in which we're scrambling against one another rather than figuring out how to grow together. That's the kind of framing that I think is not there yet. And it's not going to be around income inequality. It's going to be about how addressing equitable opportunity is actually going to drive a better America. You could end there. Or <laughs> some other inspirational closing comment you'd like to make. This might be the talk. Thank you. Go ahead and wrap up now. Uh, we we feel strongly at the Colorado Trust. Again, I I, uh, I learned we're not leading a social movement, but we're trying to uh, inspire, support, and seed that we realize we have to partner with our communities uh, to advance health equity in our state. Building social movements is a strategy, as we've learned today. It can help us share a destiny that we build together. Uh, and we believe that working together at the community level, we can achieve health equity in Colorado. So the slides from today will be posted uh, on our uh, internet. They'll be posted pretty much right away. And then uh, it takes us about a week to get the video done. So those of you who came in late or would like to see things uh, again or listen to other comments, we'll make that uh, available soon. Our next health equity uh, learning event is back here at the Colorado Center on August 21st with Llewellyn Smith, who is an executive producer of the documentary Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. And joining Llewellyn will be Laura Frank, the executive director of iNews at Rocky Mountain PBS. I'm going to ask you again if you wouldn't mind to help us uh, learn and become better as we move forward and fill out the application or the uh, evaluations that you're at your site. We actually do look at them, tabulate, and, and we try to strategically learn from those. And finally, I have to point out that um, this is truly a team effort to bring these events together from the, uh, the wisdom and direction of our trustees uh, to the staff that I have the privilege of working with every day and their flawless execution of these events. I, I have to express uh, my presentation, or my uh, uh, thanks to those groups because they help me look like I know what I'm doing. And um, thanks all of you to, for being here today. I look forward to engaging with you, your communities, and your organizations as the trust works forward in this work. Thank you. Mm -hmm.